so that's really humbling and for some of us um, it's hard to make that call and say that about ourselves because as a small business entrepreneur who started from scratch we have come to believe especially when we're a little bit successful that we can do anything and everything right because we had to do anything and everything anything and everything Hey, welcome back. This is Jeff Barnes with Angel Investors Network, and this is the Angels, Exits, and Acquisitions podcast. I'm so excited to have you here today because we are talking about something with an incredible guest, Linda Howe, about exiting a business. So if you are a business owner, if you are investing in businesses, or if you're an entrepreneur, it's really important to understand how you're going to get to that payday at the end of the rainbow, right? A lot of folks may be running a business that's successful and profitable right now, but at some point, you need to leave that business and preparing to exit so you can make the most amount of money and increase the value of that company along the way is very important and something that is very often overlooked by a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs. So take a listen to this episode and I can't wait to hear how you like it. Thanks. Welcome to Angels Exits and Acquisitions, the place to learn how to fund, scale, exit and massively profit as an angel investor or entrepreneur. Brought to you by the Angel Investors Network. And now here's your host, Jeff Barnes. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Angels, Exits, and Acquisitions. I am your host today again, Jeff Barnes. And I have with me today, Linda Pau, who is calling in from Belgium. So I'm really excited about that. It's her evening. She just had dinner. I just had breakfast. It's great. Um, and we're going to have a, a, a wonderful conversation about something that's near and dear to my heart because we we focus on this quite a bit in our companies and we're always looking for great companies that are looking to exit. And so, Lynn, welcome to the show. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Jeff. Wonderful. So why don't we start off, just give people a couple minutes, give us your background and how did you get to be where you are right now with the big exit? Yeah, so I've been an entrepreneur for a pretty long time now, uh, probably something like 15 years. And I consider myself a serial entrepreneur. I'm one of those people who likes to get things off the ground seeing opportunities, trying to solve problems that I'm encountering and basically build entrepreneurial businesses around that. So that's a little bit my my backstory professionally. Before that, I was in corporate for many years as a project manager, but my entrepreneurial journey has been way longer so far than my life in, in the corporate space. So I'm a serial entrepreneur. I love to build businesses, scale businesses, sell businesses. And with the big exit, I'm on a mission to educate at least a million small business owners on how to get their business ready for an exit. Awesome. That's great. So you and I have a little bit of similarities here. Um, I was actually the reluctant entrepreneur. I didn't want to be an entrepreneur because I saw my dad going through those struggles and it was a lot of fun. He ran a small business most of my life when I was growing up. And it, it was a constant struggle, ups and downs and all of the things that come along with running a small business. And so I decided actually I went into the Navy and then after that I went into a big corporate job and I had all the that the trappings of that and I was so unfulfilled. And that's how I started my my entrepreneurial journey it was disdain for authority, <laughs> first and foremost, and then wanting to have my own control of my life and my own freedom. And so I became an entrepreneur as a result of doing that. But what I found, and because I had that background in operations, systems, technology, right, working with the biggest organizations in the world, I was really good at the operational piece and scaling up a company. But what I found is there's there's really a couple different types of entrepreneurs. There's the ones that are the visionaries that just love to get something started. They love to solve a really, really big problem, but most of them have no clue how to run a business. And then there's the entrepreneurs, it sounds like you, which are I want to solve a problem. I want to build a business. I want to make money with it. And then once I get to a certain point, I kind of want to be done with it and move on to the next thing. So which camp do you fall in there? Yeah, I wouldn't consider myself a reluctant entrepreneur, but the story you're saying or, or explaining is is very, very similar to mine because I grew up in an entrepreneurial family as well with a single mom who was maybe not an entrepreneur, but a freelancer, an independent um, contractor. And I've seen the ups and downs of that journey as well. And I also decided like that is definitely not going to be my professional journey. But then at some point it kind of just 
happens. But I've always this always decided to not be a freelancer. I consider myself not just an entrepreneur, but a freedompreneur. I think a lot of your listeners as well, they're they're in business because of the freedom that it gives us, right? Um, I don't consider myself to be the biggest visionary in town, um, which it, it has its downsides and its its upsides. I would say you always have to play to your strengths. So my entrepreneurial journey is very much one of identifying a need in the market, maybe because I've seen it myself and I couldn't find a solution for something. Um, so that's kind of often where where my entrepreneurial urge comes from. So I call it, I think there's different kinds of entrepreneurs, but I'm definitely an opportunity-driven entrepreneur. So someone who sees an opportunity and then kind of jumps in it and and basically gets a kick out of solving that problem in a sustainable way, in a profitable way, in a way that's fun. Uh, but then once a business gets to a certain point and it's requiring a lot of managerial um, activities, that is not in my zone of genius. Although I'm an engineer, I'm pretty strong operationally, but I find it quite draining. So if I need to be the manager and having the manager cap on for um, an extended period of time, I'm I'm not in my zone of genius. And and I will suffer from it. My family will suffer from it. Uh, my team will suffer from it. The business will suffer from it. So I think, as you say, righteously, right? It, it, when we're on an entrepreneurial journey, it's all about understanding our strengths and and playing to our strengths, right? Absolutely. Well, and you said a few things there that are really important. The freedompreneur, and you know, we we when we talk about entrepreneurship. And I always try not to paint that rose-colored lens version of entrepreneurship because you are in the trenches and you are do- doing the dirty work day in and day out until you get to a certain point that you can hire people. And it's not even until long after that that you realize and you finally get a little bit of that freedom that you start to realize the freedom that entrepreneurship can bring. Because a lot of the times it is a struggle, right? And you know, we joke that entrepreneurs are the only ones crazy enough to quit a $40 per hour or 40 hour per week job making maybe six figures so they can go work for free for somebody that's going to drive them crazy working 80 hours a week and that's themselves, right? Um, and so, you know, that freedom aspect is what drives us into that. And I, I have found that entrepreneurs that have that as the drive are generally more successful than the ones who just have this desire to make money, right? The ones that just desire to make money, right? Because they think the money will bring them the freedom, don't understand it. They, the ones that have that desire for freedom first, and this is why we really focus on freedom and autonomy, and that's one of my core values right there, is those are the people that no matter how hard the day is, no matter how long the day is, no matter how many setbacks there are, no matter like when you have your bank accounts overdrawn and you're you're dealing with, okay, payroll's coming up, how am I going to get it going? A lot of people quit right then and there, right? They'll never go back to it and they'll never try again. But the folks that really, really want that freedom, they're going to persevere. They're going to push through that, right? And they'll 100%. figure out how to get there. Hundred percent. I I've been guiding thousands of small business owners and entrepreneurs over the last fifteen years, and that's exactly that. If if you're if you're in it just for the money, I think money should be a driver, though, because you're in business. Sure. You're, you're you don't you're run a non-profit. philanthropy, yeah. right? So uh, money should be a driver there. But if that's your main driver. I mean, when the first recession hits, when the first, you know, obstacle hits, when you're having to plow through months of very, very lean income in the business and stuff like that, it's really, really hard to push through if if it's all about the money, right? But mm-hmm. as you were saying correctly, like when you're thinking about freedom and that's your main goal, often the, the downs, like... If if freedom is your goal, your alternative for a non-working business would be to go back and get a job, which you know is not going to give you that freedom, yeah. right? So it's kind of like you don't really have a plan B when freedom is your main thing. When making money is your main thing, there's always a plan B because you can always get like a really sweet six-figure job somewhere and, and just go on and do that, right? But when yep. freedom is your goal, that kind of plan B doesn't really exist anymore so it's kind of like you have to push through and it's a really intrinsic driver 
And I, I do believe money is an external driver, mm -hmm. right? Um, but when you're driven from the inside out, that's what's going to, um, you know, like push you through some of the hard times that every single entrepreneur will experience throughout their journey, even when absolutely. you're a freedompreneur. Yeah, absolutely. It, and it's, it's such an important value to have because, you know, and all of the entrepreneurs that I work with that I see pushing, freedom is in their top three, maybe five, but generally their top three values, right? And it's, it's really a big push for that. And so when we're talking about investing in businesses or acquiring businesses and things like that, if we're going to invest in a startup, we need to know the core values and the, the impetus behind the founder. Like, what are they trying to do? And sometimes it is, I'm trying to solve this really, really big problem and come hell or high water, I'm going to solve this problem. That's one thing we really look for. But that person that wants the freedom it's really, really important to understand that because if you know that they've burned the boats and they're not going back, no matter what, that is a really good sign for you as the investor and the owner of a business, right? So I think that's just something that people should be looking into. Now, you have exited businesses. So can you tell folks like the, the number of exits you may have, might have had and what, what's been like your favorite process of exiting business? Because I think you fall into that camp of, like you were saying, once it gets to, I need to manage people, which I heard a great saying from uh, one of the military leaders a long, long time ago, which is we, we don't manage people. We, we lead people, we manage systems, right? And love that. once we get to a certain point, leading people is what we want to do, right? As an entrepreneur, we really do want to lead people. Now, I'm curious on your take on this. We really want to lead people, but the, the problem with that is that so many people really just want to clock in and clock out. And they don't necessarily want to take on additional responsibility. They don't necessarily want to help you grow a business. They want a paycheck, which is where management comes in. Now we need to manage and we need to make benchmarks and KPIs and, and all of that. And so the people part is, I think, really where a lot of entrepreneurs get kind of bored and frustrated. Like you were saying, now I have to start managing all these little things and people are coming to me with problems. And I don't want to deal with that. Like, I just want to grow the business. If we could just keep growing the business, that'd be great. But... There's always the human capital component of that, right? So I'm curious what your take is on that. Yeah, there, there's a lot of, there's so much to un unpack in, in your question and in, in, your state, state, um, uh, in your statement there. But when we're talking about people, definitely, I, I see this all the time. When you're scaling, whether that's scaling for the sake of growth or whether you're scaling for the sake of an exit, the people part always comes back. You know, a business is as good as the I don't like to use this word, but let me just use it for like not having a better word. But like the, the strength of a business always depends on its weakest link, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of businesses are very human centered. It's, it's the people in the team that deliver the value for the clients, deliver the value for their other colleagues, deliver the value for the suppliers, deliver the value for the society. Um, and it's one of the biggest things um that a lot of small business owners struggle will, with is like scaling i always say it's scaling beyond yourself mm -hmm. like how do you do that how do you maintain that value or those values that you have as an entrepreneur and those might be freedom how do you maintain these values when you're growing your team and how do you look for the right kind of people that share these values with you um i honestly truly believe that uh, you um, you get the people that you think you deserve as an entrepreneur. Um, mm -hmm. That sounds a little bit wishy-washy or <laughs> a little bit um, uh, wobbly, but I do tend to believe that, and this is an obstacle that I see with a lot of small business owners, specifically if they haven't hired that well in the past. But if you do believe that the best person out there is the one that wants to work for your business and you can you know, kind of get them excited to work for your business. I truly believe that's how you build like a team of A, a players, right? Is really truly believing that the best people who are out there are the ones that want to work for your business. And for some businesses, that means they want to hire people who clock in and clock out, do the work, get the paycheck and go home. Mm -hmm. Like that's the kind of employees that make a business run very stably, right? 
And then you also need those kinds of um, employees that can walk the extra mile or can run the extra mile for you and your organization as well. Um, and I think so it's kind of like having that mixture of people um, in your team, right? And if you feel mm -hmm. like someone's not the right fit culturally because they are showing a work ethic that doesn't align with your values, I mean, we always say like, like hire really slow and fire very fast. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I think is really important for small business owners. We often do the opposite, yeah. right? We we hire fast because we gonna we want to get rid of stuff we don't want to do anymore. So we hire really fast and then we take a very very long time to try to make things work sometimes with employees, but it never ever really works out, right? And then it just takes way too long. So Hire slow, fire fast. That's definitely when it comes to team building. One of the main um, advices that I have for entrepreneurs. There's more, but I'll, yeah. I'll leave it to you first because I saw you nodding and maybe you want to pick in on a couple of things. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Always hire slow, fire fast. It's hard to do. Like you were saying, it goes against our nature. We want to just hire somebody to fill this role, but we forget there is a right fit. But my, my, my point was really, yes, you always need those people that are going to be that nine to five check in, check out. But as the entrepreneur, the founder, it's really hard for us to understand that mentality, right? We want to grow and we want to go fast. And so when you get to that point, you know, there's different benchmarks in the business. You know, the first million to bring it, you bring in 5 million, 10 million, 50 million, 100 million. And once you get to 100 million and beyond, you know, then you are running multiple businesses and you need department heads, you need all of these other things. And so, you now need to have those dedicated, tried and true employees that are going to come in and do their job very, very well. My point in saying that is that the entrepreneur is generally a terrible manager for those people, right? Because they just don't understand the psyche of those individuals, nor do they have the patience to build the training programs, the processes and the procedures and do all of that, right? And so, like you said, in the very beginning, you get to a point where it's okay, now it's time for me to exit because I realize, and it's really important that entrepreneurs know this about themselves. I realize that now I can't add the kind of value to this business that I want to because it needs a different type of leader in this position. And so let's talk 100%. about you. You've done this yourself. Um, you, you've identified what that is for you, but how do you make that decision? And then can you walk us through what that exit process has looked like for you? Before continuing, please subscribe and share this video to help us reach more people and stay notified of our latest releases. Now, let's continue watching and learning. Yeah, it's it's a humbling journey because it's on one hand, it's recognizing that you are not the right person for the job. Yeah. That's one thing. So that's really humbling. And for some of us, um, it's hard to make that call and say that about ourselves because as a small business entrepreneur who started from scratch, we have come to believe, especially when we're a little bit successful, that we can do anything and everything, right? Because we had to do anything and everything. Um, but then at some point, the business just gets to a point where it's requiring a different skill set. And I think when business owners get to a point where they're often one frustrated when they come home about the stuff that they need to deal with, feel you know they're hitting the snooze button more often than uh, what they would normally do um, they feel more drained rather than energetic or they come to realize that like 90 percent of the stuff that they do at work is kind of it drains them rather than it gives them energy that's kind of like the signals right there that you should listen to and honor to now a lot of small business owners that i know and and i don't know if this you've heard these stories before is that a lot of small businesses they burn on they don't burn out they burn on for a really 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 long time until they get to a point where they literally want to get rid of their business so they, they don't they don't want to spend like literally a single minute anymore with this business which is and i have been there too late to sell your business because very Let's likely, talk about that really quickly, not to interrupt you there, but that is such an important thing that I think a lot of people say, I've, I've consulted and advised companies that want to get to a certain valuation so they can exit. And what you just said right now is that they, 
they burn on to a point where selling their business is not really an option. Or my guess is even if they could sell, it's not for valuation they want. So what do you mean by that? Let's unpack that a little bit. Yeah, there's there's different ways to look at this, right? But when we're burning on, if I can use that term, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's an official term, but it's it's one that I use. Lots of small business owners burn on for a really, really long time. It basically means that they're constantly draining and like using very deep energy sources from within because they don't get a lot of energy from the the, the tasks that they are doing within their their own business, right? So, but what happens? When you're in this, and sometimes this can take years, even decades of burning on, and this might be because you're striving for a certain valuation or you're striving to reach a certain revenue because you think that's going to give you that freedom, right? That's It's again, that that freedom value that comes into play. You're kind of like burning on to get to some imaginary goal that you think is going to give you the thing that you want. That's often, you know, what leads to then eventually burnout. Um, but I think when you're going through that process as a as a business owner of like years and even decades of burning on, what actually happens with your business is it's not performing at its best. Mm-hmm. And you have to push and pull more and more and more in order for your business to reach whatever you think it needs to reach. Um, And often the business gets more on a decline even rather than a growth trajectory. The owner doesn't have, you know, not the capacity anymore for innovation, not the capacity anymore to go and look outwards to see what's happening in the market, not the capacity anymore to stay on top of trends that might, you know, influence their business space in the next five or 10 years. Uh, they might ha- don't have the energy anymore to really lead with values to their team. And all these things combined really lead to often a business that gets more, more and more on a decline or a very slow burning on kind of a growth. Yeah, so they start um, smoldering a little bit. So instead of being a big flame, like a bonfire, now it's just a smolder. It's just like barely putting out any heat anymore. And so... Yeah. yeah. And, and if they're trying to exit, and I know I, I look at deals every single day, I don't want to look at the one that's in decline. I don't want to buy a problem. Right. And I think that's what you're getting at is that if you want to exit your business, you kind of want to exit at the peak. You don't want to wait and just push and then, okay, hopefully I can get more. And then, like you said, burn on and then eventually get into the smoldering little flame. Yeah. You want to sell. And to when add it's to that, to Jeff, I, I think you want to sell at the peak of your business. And, but these might not necessarily collide, you want to sell at your peak right? as a business owner as well. So, I th- and if these two combined together, like that's the sweet spot for selling, right? Because when you can sell at your personal peak too, you're still really enthusiastic. You're like, I'm happy to stay, ready to go. I don't need to sell this thing. If you bring me a really sweet deal, I will sell this thing. You're in such a very different position, a very empowered position, which is great for a buyer as well, right? You can get them enthusiastic about this business too. You can show them the opportunities. You can show them the growth potential because you've done your homework. You're still very much engaged into this business. So I think the best time to sell, but that's really hard to kind of combine is when your business is at the peak. And where you are, when you are at a peak as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we only have a few minutes left here, but, and I, we could talk about this all day. And so we might have to do a follow on interview to this and talk a little bit more, but you know, when it comes to exiting a business, this is one of the, the scariest, maybe misunderstood pieces of entrepreneurship because we, we read, read the headlines. Okay. This series, a financing series, D, this company went public, but we don't hear about the thousands and thousands of little side deals that happen where small businesses sell to somebody for, you know, as little as a few hundred thousand dollars to, and you're, I know you're in Europe, so euros, but to tens of millions, right? So when you're working with a client and you're helping, like you said, you want to train these million or talk to these million small business owners about how they can exit, which there's something like in the U S alone, 
10 trillion dollars worth of baby boomer businesses that are going to transition over the next decade it's an incredible number it's a mind-boggling number and most of these i've heard a statistic that 80 percent of businesses they get listed with a business broker fail to sell so yeah. they end up just shutting the doors because they can't find anyone to buy it because to your point they haven't learned how to position so what do you when you get a client on Let's just say they're they're doing maybe a few million dollars a year and they've been doing a few million dollars a year consistently, but they're not really growing and they're not declining. What are some of the things you look at with them to try and help them understand how to get ready for that exit? Yeah, this is a great question. So um, one of the things or the most important thing, what we see in the market is there's a massive gap in knowledge when it comes down to what makes a business sellable and what makes a business valuable. Most of small business owners is owners that we get to work with, and we mainly educate them. So we don't necessarily do one-on-one -on -one coaching with them, but we give them the knowledge, the power of knowledge mm -hmm. of knowing what makes my business valuable, what makes my business valuable, and what are the things that I don't do yet, but should be doing in order to either increase the value or increase the sellability of my business. So that's key, right? And when we look at a couple of things, like we see common themes coming back um, in terms of like what makes a business valuable and sellable. And this is not rocket science. It's, it's, it's common sense, right? It's like you, you say as well, as a buyer, you don't want to buy a problem. Mm -hmm. You want to buy something great and make it even better. Yeah. That's the key thing. So for a lot of small business owners, that means like having their financials in place, making sure it's profitable. It doesn't need to be growing at 15 or 20% a year, but at least not going downhill. Like that's a really good sign. Mm -hmm. And it needs to make money. Profitable businesses are great. Like specifically for small businesses, bigger businesses, you get to meet different kinds of buyers. But for small business owners who make like less than 2 million a year, profitability is key. So that's one of the things. Second, because they are so small, the biggest thing that they need to work on is creating independence between the business owner and the business. So this is building the team, having your key employees, your systems in place, structures, procedures, automations, and stuff like that. When those things are kind of said and done, you have a really sweet, awesome business to sell. And as you were rightfully saying, I mean, when we get to read about exits, we read about this really big, impressive numbers and these really big deals uh, often in the VC space and yeah. in the external capital space. But as you were saying rightly, most businesses in the US, but globally as well, are small businesses that are often 100% uh, fully owned by uh, the owners. They are often bootstrapped as well. They don't have external capital in there. And there's a massive gap of knowledge with these small business owners. So they tend to just plow through uh, their entrepreneurial journey until they reach retirement age, which as you mentioned, there's a tsunami coming our way of baby boomers that are looking to retire in the next decade. And a lot of them do not have sellable businesses. So, so if you're listening and that is you, um, or even if you're not looking at retirement yet, but you're thinking of selling in the next couple of years is, you know, the best time to get started with preparing for your exit is when you started your business. The second best yeah. time is now. So get your act together, gain some knowledge around what makes your business valuable and sellable, sellable, get a valuation done. You would be surprised how many small business owners have no clue what their business is worth whatsoever. So just get that done and then work towards um, exiting your uh, business rather than just keeping it alive for a couple of years to go and then and then hopefully pray to the gods, actually That's sell it. <laughs> no, I love that, Lynn. So I'd imagine you guys have some resource that people could learn about. So how do people find you and how do people, you know, kind of tap into what you guys have? Yeah, if they want to contact me directly, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So feel free to put my LinkedIn um, link into the show notes if, if you're creating show notes, uh, Jeff. Mm -hmm. If you go to thebigexit.co, you'll find a lot of information on how you can learn to prepare and sell your small business for maximum value. We have a very extensive blog where we 
write about all the things related to small businesses selling. We have two flagship courses that we um, basically have created for small business owners to increase their knowledge on how to prepare their business for a sale. And then we have a couple of freebies that people can uh, use as well. We have a really great quiz that people love on is your business sellable or what makes your business sellable. Um, so all of that stuff can be found on our website, thebigexit.co. Awesome. Wonderful. Linda Powell, thank you so much for being here on the Angels, Exits, and Acquisitions podcast. It's been a pleasure. I think we'll have to have you back to talk even more about the exit side of business because this is something that so many people need and they need to know more information about how to prepare all the little nuances and things like that. So we'll, we'll definitely schedule having you back on another time. Thank you so much for being here. And for those of you watching and listening, that's thebigexit.co and we will put everything in the show notes. So Lynn, thank you so much again. Thanks for having me. You bet. <laughs>